Welcome to the MSME Radio Network. The broadcast shows are for informational and entertainment purposes only. They are not designed to provide listeners with specific personal, medical, or counseling advice. Individuals with a medical issue should always consult their health care provider. MSME is not responsible for content of individual shows. The views expressed by show hosts or their guests are their own. Enjoy the show. Welcome to MSME Interviews. I am your host, Erica Lyons Richardson. Today we are continuing our hashtag WeHaveMS series for 2018. Our topic today is questions we receive from patients who have been recently diagnosed around the globe. The questions have come through on our various social media platforms and forums. What has been most surprising is the lack of basic disease information provided to these patients when they were diagnosed. That was revealed through their questions and they had no idea the most common MS symptoms were in any way disease related. Also concerning was their confusion on what their response should be when one of these symptoms would arise. Uh, When do we call our doctor or MS nurse? How long do we wait? When should we go to the ER? Navigating basic life with MS and becoming very stressful due to lack of MS knowledge. That's when the officers of MSME Media decided to start compiling the most often observed questions on our social media and bringing those to you in a Q&A format several times during 2018. As a disclaimer, most of the questions are being answered by fellow patients who have been living with MS for decades and not by medical professionals. It is our hope that the information you hear will open a dialogue with you and your physician. Now let's get started. Our first question is, what are the types of MS? My doctor didn't tell me my type. Okay, let's start with clinically isolated syndrome, CIS. CIS is a first episode of neurologic symptoms typical of those caused by inflammation in the central nervous system. It must be at least 24 hours. It's characteristic of multiple sclerosis, but not, but not yet uh, meet the criteria for a diagnosis of MS because people who experience CIS may or may not go on to develop multiple sclerosis. When CIS is accompanied by lesions on the brain, MRI, uh, that are similar to those seen in MS, the person has a high likelihood of a second episode of neurologic symptoms and diagnosis of relapsing remitting MS. When CIS is not accompanied by MS-like lesions on the brain through MRI, the person has a much lower likelihood of developing multiple sclerosis. In the meantime, patients with CIS who are considered at high risk for developing MS may now be treated with disease-modifying therapy. Early treatment of CIS has been shown to delay the onset of multiple sclerosis. Now, relapsing remitting MS, uh, RRMS (laughs) as we most refer to it, is the most common type of MS. It's characterized by clearly defined attacks of new or increasing neurologic symptoms. These attacks, also called relapses or exacerbations, are followed by periods of partial or complete recovery or remissions. Uh, During remissions, all symptoms may disappear or some symptoms may continue and become permanent. However, there is no apparent progression of the disease during the periods of remission. We now know with new research and improved imagery that activity and progression can still be ongoing. At different points in time, RRMS can be further characterized as either active, that's with relapses and or evidence of new MRI activity, or not active as well with worsening, which if someone says you have RRMS with worsening, that's a confirmed increase in disability over a specific period of time followed by a relapse, or you can have RRMS without worsening. 
Okay, approximately 85% of people with MS are initially diagnosed with RRMS. Primary progressive MS, PPMS, uh, that is its own type and it is a primary diagnosis. In other words, you don't get PPMMS after you have RRMS. You start out your disease course as PPMS. So primary progressive MS is characterized by worsening neurologic function, which is accumulation of disability, from the onset of symptoms without early relapses or remissions. PPMS can be considered active with an occasional relapse or evidence of new MRI activity or the most common not active, as well as with progression, the key to PPMS, evidence of disease worsening on an objective measure of changing over time with or without relapse or new MRI activity or without progression. Approximately 15% of people with MS are diagnosed with PPMS, about 5% considered PPMS active. Now, secondary uh, progressive MS or SPMS. SPMS follows an initial relapsing remitting course most people who are diagnosed with RRMS will eventually transition to a secondary progressive course in which there is progressive worsening of neurologic function, which is accumulation of disability over time. SPMS can at different points in time be either active with the relapses or new evidence of MRI activity or not active as well as with progression or without just like as with PPMS. Nobody starts out as SPMS. However, some patients um, have already transitioned to that type by the time they're diagnosed. That's rare, but it does happen. Okay, the next question um, we get quite often is, is MS genetic? All autoimmune diseases are caused by a group of over 150 gene mutations. So yes, MS is a primary genetic disease, but that is different than directly inherited. It, it takes an environmental factor to activate the disease process, even if you carry these gene mutations in your RNA. So what is an environmental trigger? That's everyone's first question. What are the triggers? There are known triggers for MS, like Epstein-Barr virus, which is responsible for mono, cigarette smoke, extreme trauma, there are so many triggers that have already been identified. The reason the disease is called genetic and not hereditary is that most types of MS is not a guarantee that you'll develop MS just because you carry these gene mutations. So you might say, but I'm the first in my family. That may be very true because you are the first who got the combo of genes from your mom and dad and your other relatives in generation past did develop autoimmune diseases from the same genetic gene mutations like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, etc. But generation after generation can carry the mutation without an environmental trigger starting that MS process. So not all of our kids are going to get MS. However, you can see why in many families, multiple siblings and generations do. But many say, I'm the first because those other relatives, um, especially in the past before modern testing, were not diagnosed as MS, were not diagnosed as rheumatoid arthritis. They weren't diagnosed as having celiac disease, even though they exhibited those symptoms and did not know what the source was. Or it may be that they just didn't voice that. In generations past, people didn't always talk about diseases. They even used to whisper cancer. So um, they didn't talk about diseases they had or pass that gener you know, down generationally. So you might not have complete genetic information from both sides of your family. And you might not have known that um, uh, gene-wise, RNA-wise, that uh, your uncle's uh, type 1 diabetes was in some way related to your diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Now, there is an RNA blood test for MS here in the U.S. that must be prescribed by a doctor for those already triggered symptoms. Uh, it's not covered by insurance. 
there is a blood test antibody test developed in Australia as well. Uh, in other countries, you will see available soon. So uh, these things are becoming hered are becoming available uh, in different countries. Uh, the blood test here in the U.S. is available um, through Iquity once prescribed by your doctor. But as I said, not covered by insurance. But there is um, that funding available on the website if you go to I. Acuity, Q U I T Y, so I Q U I T Y dot com. If you guys want to check that out, if it's prescribed by your doctor. Um, and as I said, Australia and many other countries are also uh, making antibody tests available soon. Um, but autoimmune diseases are genetic. Some rare types of PPMS and others have been found to be hereditary. I'm sure that's all, um, you know, on your mind. Like, how can me and my twin sister and my mom and my aunt all have MS and it not be hereditary? It's because it still, in most types, has to be triggered by that, you know, environmental factor for anyone to even um, start the disease course. Uh, but you can reduce your children's risk factors. Everybody's all worried, oh, well, can my kid get this? You know, how... how um, um, likely are they to inherit this. They're not going to inherit MS, but they could ch carry uh, these gene mutations in their RNA, and you can reduce their risk factors of developing MS or another autoimmune disease. For MS, if you um, prevent childhood obesity, monitor their vitamin D levels, uh, avoid cigarette smoking you know, exposure, uh, try lowering their risk of uh, post-adolescent concussion, things like that. There are ways of reducing risk. So just speak with your doctor about that, what your child's risk might be and how you might lower that risk. Definitely do not go out and give them the latest hot, you know, supplement or vitamin like vitamin D and, you know, without having their levels checked. Children can receive toxic levels of these vitamins if they are not deficient. So please get their levels checked before you start supplementing. Now, the next question we receive quite often is, why is my DMT like Capaxone, Tecfidera, and the rest preventing my hand uh, from tingling and my legs from feeling? Why is it not preventing those symptoms uh, that I'm having with my MS? My legs still feel heavy. Uh, Disease-modifying therapies. They're designed to prevent relapses and new damage. They do not impact your existing MS symptoms, the damage already done. You have to choose, you know, additional medications or natural choices to control those symptoms. Uh, modifying diet and exercise can also help in controlling symptoms. That's why they prescribe PTOT um, after many of your relapses. Patients are often prescribed medications to control muscle spasms, nerve pain, etc. Natural choices do not prevent relapses, but can also be used under doctor supervision to treat your symptoms. MS is from activity triggered in our genes. People have been able to put their symptoms in remission with those natural measures. However, they still have MS and they can still have the disabling relapse. So they can have HSCT, they can use natural choices, they can use DMTs, all these things available to us. However, it's still in our RNA, and if exposed to the same environmental trigger, the same effect can happen. So we can't predict if and when this happens, so it's a very personal choice which treatment path you choose. Discuss it with your doctor. You may have comorbidities that make your choice very different than someone you're speaking to on social media and they say, oh no, this helped me and I haven't had symptoms for three years. Well, your type of MS, your trigger, your comorbidities, your general health could be different and give you a different result. So you definitely want to discuss all of these choices with your doctor. And also another warning, when you see people recommend a diet, um, a level of vitamin, uh, how many IUs they're taking, uh, vitamin D or whatever, uh, biotin, what, what have you, 
Or um, you see someone who says, oh, well, I take gabapentin. I take blah, blah, blah milligrams a day. It, that's what works for them, okay? Your case may be very, very different. Uh, you may have other conditions that would actually, that would actually be dangerous for. Body weight, uh, sex, all kinds of different things impact how much and how often we take medications or even natural choices. And yes, natural choices can also be dangerous if taken in the wrong amounts at the wrong time, etc. And mixed with other treatments. So you have to discuss these things with your doctor. Make sure your doctor knows when you're even taking natural choices or supplements. Make sure they know that can impact your future treatment choices. Okay, so this is very important that you share all information, full disclosure, with your doctor. So make sure you update them if you make any changes. Okay, next question. How do I know if I'm seeing an MS specialist? Okay, many neurologists call themselves MS specialists in that they treat primarily MS patients. However, a true MS specialist that went to extra schooling focused on the treatment of multiple sclerosis is called a neuroimmunologist. That is very important for you to learn. Neuroimmunologist. Okay, what does that mean they went to extra schooling? That means when you're studying neurology in medical school and that's your specialty, you're learning about patients with Alzheimer's and with migraines and with Parkinson's and with many, many, many neurological diseases across the scope. Now, if you are um, going to extra schooling and you're going to become certified as a neuroimmunologist, okay, that's going to be your licensing in neuroimmunology, you are going to be studying multiple sclerosis. That's going to be your focus, the latest research, the latest treatment, Everything you can learn <laughs> is about multiple sclerosis, okay? So that's why we often recommend, and so does the MS societies around the world, that you see an MS specialist, which is a neuroimmunologist, all right? So that's what they mean by that. There are not enough neuroimmunologists available around the world to treat the 2.5 million patients. It's a very common disease, MS. So you might have to travel a distance to see a true MS specialist dependent upon where you live. I live in a little more populated area, so I only travel an hour to see my MS specialist, my neuroimmunologist. However, I have friends who travel three hours, one who travels across states, um, in other countries, you know, you might really be in a really isolated area and it might be difficult for you to even see one. So it really is dependent upon what part of the globe you live and how prevalent they are in your area. Now, does that mean you can't receive good care from a neurologist? Absolutely not. Um, I mean, if you're confident in the care you're receiving, that's your personal choice. As a matter of fact, the first doctor who gave me the correct diagnosis was a neurologist. He was not a neuroimmunologist. So you can get good care, especially good introductory care, from a neurologist. Sometimes if you have a more advanced or a complex uh, disease course, then yes, sometimes they will, as my neurologist did, um, he said, you have a very complex case. I'm going to have to refer you on to a neuroimmunologist. And that's what happened in my case. Now I've even received um, amazing care from a nurse practitioner in a neurologist's office and as well in my MS specialist's office. Now, the uh, nurse practitioner in my MS specialist's office, in the neuroimmunologist's office, she actually also had special training with multiple sclerosis herself, unlike, you know, most nurse practitioners. So uh, she herself had specialized training, and she is amazing. She really, really is. Um, so it's a personal choice. And um, there are many, many ways we can uh, get help in finding them. Now, if you cannot locate a neuroimmunologist, you can either contact the MS Society in your part of the globe or your insurance company. Definitely here in America, that is a plus. If your insurance does not cover um, the 
MS specialist in your area, you can have your primary physician appeal that with your insurance uh, showing medical necessity for you to see that MS specialist and you get an override to have the MS specialist billed as in-network, basically, is what happens, which is what has happened in my case. So each year when it runs out, or six months if it runs out, if that's what they got it approved for, then my PCP has to send more information over to my insurance company showing why, look, this is the only neuroimmunologist in this area, and this is why Erica needs to see the neuroimmunologist instead of a regular neurologist. So that is definitely a plus. So we get so many questions, uh, especially from those newly diagnosed, uh, from it's about, you know, is this or that MS related? The answer is always maybe. Not everything is caused by MS activity. However, if a new sy symptom lasts more than 24 hours, you should notify your doctor. If it's possibly life-threatening, you go to the ER. Now, that being said, let's go over a list of possible MS symptoms, possible being the operative word here. Reminder that each patient can experience different symptoms, and some patients will never experience many of these symptoms. And of course, some of you out there may be listening, especially more advanced patients going, uh, I have all the above. <laughs> And reminder that this is just a short, concise list for this show. There are many, many more. Okay, pain areas like in the back, limbs, headache, or eyes with movement. Uh, tremor, it can cause occurring precise movements in the hands or limbs or head tremor. So when you go to move your limbs to reach for something or your head may even tremor when you turn it or just hold it up. Right. Uh, muscular, you can get cramping. Difficulty walking, inability to rapidly change motions, involuntary movements, muscle paralysis, muscle rigidity, muscle weakness, uh, problems with your coordination, stiff muscles, clumsiness, muscle spasms, or overactive reflexes. Now, whole body uh, fatigue, dizziness, heat intolerance, cold intolerance, uh, poor balance, a vertigo, uh, or just weakness, overall weakness. Now, a sensory, those pins and needles, um, we just call them, sometimes you just say, I'm numb. Uh, abnormality of taste, um, sin, reduced sensation of touch, uncomfortable tingling and burning, uh, itching, sensitivity to noise, even sometimes uh, your hearing loss or partial hearing loss. Um, a really big one is tinnitus, ringing in the ears is what that is. Uh, urinary, excessive urination at night, a leaking of urine, a complete, you know, urinary incontinence, a persistent urge to urinate, urinary retention. Another one can be bowel dysfunction in uh, uh, even complete uh, loss of bowel uh, control. Uh, visual. Blurred vision, double vision, a vision loss, shaking eyes, um, uh, crossing eyes. Your eye might cross. And these can be in both eyes or just one. Uh, like optic neuritis, uh, which is the attack to the optic nerves in part of the central nervous system. It can sometimes more commonly be just one eye. I had it in both and had almost total vision loss twice in both eyes, but it did come back. So you can get partial or um, all of your vision back. Now, a sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, or just sexual dysfunction, uh, including pain, loss of sensation. Uh, there's so many under sexual dysfunction. Uh, mood, anxiety or mood swings, depression, suicide. Multiple sclerosis has the highest suicide rate of any other disease. Speech. Slurred speech, impaired voice, stutter, high, um, let's see, shaky, high pitch, lower pitch. Uh, I used to be called at work Minnie Mouse <laughs> because mine went higher. Uh, I completely uh, lost uh, ability to make uh, voice sounds for a long time and went to speech therapy uh, because I couldn't get enough lung power from my lung damage, um, which was from multiple sclerosis, that I couldn't make those breath sounds. Now, 
also common, constipation, difficulty swallowing, uh, difficulty thinking, understanding, uh, heavy legs, numbness of face, sleep deprivation, tongue numbness, uh, difficulty raising your foot, digestive issues, as I mentioned, frequent infections, edema, uh, which is that swelling of your legs, uncontrollable laughing or crying, uh, trouble with word choice. There are many, many more, which we will discuss on future shows. So we will um, continue this series through uh, just occasionally throughout 2008. We'll have the hashtag we have MS series where we highlight your questions or highlight a person living with multiple sclerosis and hear their personal stories to inspire us all. We will also continue our interviews of, of the researchers and the physicians and clinicians who serve the MS community. So we'll continue all of that through 2008. So I'm really excited about this series. I think it will really help a lot of the newly diagnosed and also those of us that have been living with MS for decades. So thank you all for joining me this week. We'll continue this series, like I said. And for additional information, visit our website, www.msandmemedia.com. That's msandmemedia.com. You can also see our archive shows. Our archive radio shows are on our YouTube channel. So just go to MS and Me Radio and Media and you'll find all of our archive shows from all of the different hosts from around the globe. There's a wealth of information there. We are also on social media with our forums and pages and services and news, MSME News. If you want to uh, join in the forums, you can find us on, um, on Facebook. Just search for the MSME groups. You'll just see all of them, a whole list. You can go to our main page at MSME Radio and Media. So you'll see all of, a listing in the pin post there of all of our groups and services. You'll also find us on Instagram and Twitter. We have several Twitter pages. And one of our new fun initiatives is hashtag um, MS Racing MS, sorry, hashtag Racing MS through our MSME Racing Division. So it's really cool. That That's a really fun thing where um, we follow the iRacers each week. And we have racers on our team who are spreading awareness, global awareness for multiple sclerosis. So join me again next week on MSME Interviews right here on the MSME Radio Network where you will find 24-hour global MS radio. Thank you.